know, my, one of my phrases I use, there are times when I only open my mouth to swap feet. So uh, we, we do that sometimes as well. So enough about that. If you have your Bibles, turn to the Old Testament book of Micah. Micah, uh, not too far from the end of the Old Testament. If you're not familiar, it's a, small, it's a minor prophet. And uh, I've been saying this all along, but I'm going to remind you because some people here maybe not didn't hear this. Uh, the minor prophets are called minor not because of importance or significance, but because of the size of the books. Uh, they're minor prophets. So uh, we're in book of Micah. We're in uh, chapter 6, if you're finding that uh, and I will make reference to some other passages. Uh, what I've learned is I love preaching through the books, okay? And if you notice in some of the earlier books, uh, we went almost verse by verse. And But when we, when we got to some of the uh, latter, uh, later books, uh, there's a, a lot of reputation, repetition. So uh, to, to save a little bit of repetition... Uh, I'm, I'm using some other passages, even New Testament, uh, to kind of go along with this theme of repentance. And I don't think it's an, an accident that God's put us on repentance. Uh, uh, the men in the Sunday school class I was in this morning, I, it just thrilled me to know that some of the things they were talking about in there. They started off talking about repentance. They, they, they talked about some of the um, one of our men mentioned uh, one of the so-called preachers in Houston, Texas, that I don't like to call their names, but Joel Osteen is not somebody I consider a preacher, okay? Uh, he's more of a motivational speaker. Uh, and he will make you feel good. And uh, if you listen to me much, uh, most of our folks here, they'll say, well, that's, Brother Kirk's not going to make you feel good. Well, I hope I'll make you feel good. I hope I'm not a discouragement to you, but this is the way I want to encourage you. Okay, the Word of God is a sword. It cuts. Sometimes it cuts really deep. But isn't that the truth? Uh, I, use, I, I use the example like this, this illustration. When you go to the doctor and if you think something's seriously wrong with you, you want someone to just tell you, hey, man, this is going to be okay. Just keep eating what you're eating. Keep doing what you're doing. you got something wrong with you, but I don't know what it is. Just keep doing what you're doing. You're going to die. Don't worry about it. That's not the doctor I want. I want the doctor that's going to tell me the truth, even if I, if it's the truth, not what I want to hear. Aren't you? I mean, they get paid big money. They need to be pay, telling us the truth, right? And and if it's something I need to do differently, I want to know it. Uh, some of those hard truths, and, and that's very similar to the Word of God. I'm telling you, the Word of God is... It's so sweet, it's so personal, it's, it's so powerful, but it's powerful because it, 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 it's powerful with the intentional purpose of changing lives. And by the way, while I'm on this, this is not part of the message, but while I'm on this, uh, I talked to a, a, and some of you have heard me tell this before, but uh, driving a school bus, Memphis, Tennessee, a few years back, teenage boy, very intelligent, uh, we got to talking a little bit, and he, I wouldn't, I don't know that he was a Christian, but he was, he was really thinking about spiritual things. And he told me, he said, my teachers have told me I'm a genius. Now, some kids tell you that, and you think, yeah, right. But this kid really was. I mean, his biggest challenge in life seemed like was just carrying on a conversation. He could write it. He could send an email. He could, but just speaking and interacting, he boy, he struggled and it was tough. But this is what I got from him. He said, and I think it might have been in an email or something. But he said um, something to the effect of of being challenging, believing the Bible's true and and God is uh, real and he, you know a lot of these things a lot of a lot of people deal with. But here's what God gave me for him. Because to be honest with you, I couldn't match wits with him. He was a really sharp young man. 
But here's what God gave me to give to him, and I've used it since then. I said, uh, named his name, I said, you know what? This is how I know that God is real and how God, why, or that God exists. He, he said, how? I said, because of my changed life. I said, you know how you know God is real? One of the best evidences, and we, there's a lot of evidences, by the way. But you want know the best evidence that God is real and that he's a personal God? Because he changed his lives. Now, I don't care if the most intelligent, the, the greatest thinker in the world, if they're atheistic, whatever they are, who can argue with that? Who can argue with you if your life has been changed? Because they don't know your life. They don't know what God's done. And for us as believers, that's our testimony. Our personal testimony is so powerful. Nobody can tell you what has happened that you have trouble even describing how much God has impacted your life, what He's done in you, what He's done in your heart. Who's going to dis dispel that? Nobody can. It's yours, your personal testimony. That has nothing, well, maybe it does have something to do with the message this morning. But if you got your Bibles, uh, Micah chapter 6. Uh, and even before I say that, I want to tell you a couple other things. God's Word can both, re, can both destroy and restore. You hear me? The Bible can, His Word can destroy it can destroy sin. It can dis destroy a lot of things because that's the way the truth works. But it's also God's in the restoration business. He, he's, he's made a way to restore mankind, men, women, boys, and girls to him. How? Through the person of Jesus Christ. Micah's message is that God is about to call the nations to account for their sin. He's not only talking about the nation of Israel, but other nations as well. Micah prophesies the impending judgments on Samaria, which was Israel, and Jerusalem, which is Judah. The Lord's judgment of Israel and Judah is just the beginning. It will be at least as bad or worse for the rest of the nations. In chapter 2, verse 6, it's, uh, he said the, the people wanted Micah, or I was talking about the people wanted Micah to stop preaching those terrible things. See, when we talk about the feel good preachers, and there are a lot of them, by the way, I just mentioned one, but there are a lot of them. And they draw big crowds, make people feel good. Your best life now was the title of the first book, I think, that Joel Osteen wrote. Uh, and it's also been said wisely, if you follow all of his teachings, it is going to be your best life now. And that's all you're going to have. So uh, help us warn people. Warn people, don't fall for this stuff. Don't fall for things that, that, that just is designed to, to uh, come to you for you to hear and feel good about it and turn around and give toward it because ultimately a lot of it is about uh, where you send your money as well. Um, Micah chapter 6, he says this, verse 1, Now listen to what the Lord is saying. Rise, plead your case before the mountains, and let the hills hear your voice. Listen to the Lord's lawsuit. This is the Holman Christian uh, version here that I'm reading from. It says, the Lord's lawsuit. You ever think God brought a lawsuit against his people? You mountains and enduring foundations of the earth, because the Lord has a case against his people, and he will argue it against Israel. My people, what have I done to you, or how have I wearied you? Testify against me. He says, "You, I've done something against you. Bring it. Bring it, bring it to me. He says, I brought you up from the land of Egypt and redeemed you from that place of slavery. He 
delivered them. And yet, they rebelled against Him. He has given us, we get to live in a day of grace. Now, I love preaching on grace, and while this is more of a repentance-themed message, I'm telling you, I've got to, got to remind you of grace. Because everything we preach on repentance, remember when I gave you the illustration of going to the doctor, you want, you want the truth, right? Well, the truth is the whole truth. Nope, nothing but the truth, right? As we say in court. We want, we want the whole truth. The tr- and sometimes we can lean so far on the repentance part, we can, we can lean so far on the, the judging part that we, we forget grace. And oh man, we make a big mistake when we do that. Uh, we can't just look at where people are, how they're living, and just stand in, in a, in a Pharisaic, what I call a Pharisaical attitude, and, and uh, judge people and have that kind of attitude in a very unloving manner. Then we become nothing but a Pharisee, a modern day Pharisee. And I don't think anybody here wants to do that. I don't think anybody here wants to be a religious person and be known for your judgmental attitude. And uh, the church has enough of that in the past. Amen? We need to be a people of grace, a people of love, a people that literally tell people the truth, but tell them in love. You see the balance? It's with the Word of God, but it's with our actions too. It's with the expressions on our face. It's with, the, it's with our greeting. It's with... It's with grace. It's with a graceful attitude. And unless we can do that, I challenge you, don't tell them. If you can't tell people the truth in love, just keep it to yourself. Because you'll do more harm than good. You see, the truth is dangerous. The truth is something that has to be handled in the right place right perspective and the right attitude and the right the right uh, surroundings as well um, the truth must be handled gracefully so we don't just stick our finger in people's faces and say you're going to hell no some cases may be that you build a relationship with them some it may be that even if you think they are you're just sharing Jesus with them. You see, we're just instruments, and we're supposed to be sharing the truth, And but, again, in grace and love. Uh, dealing with this, with the, the main topic of, of repentance, uh, God is calling His people to repent. All throughout these Old Testament minor prophets, we, we're seeing this theme over and over of, of God giving his message to his man to be delivered, and then there's a condition or there's a challenge to repentance. So a lot of that is a repetitive uh, thing, as I said earlier. But God is reminding the people here in Micah that uh, I brought you out of slavery. I did that for you. Now I've got a case against you. you you've, you've strayed so far from me. I'm calling you to repentance. And I'm giving you an opportunity. And here is where we need to take it very serious. Here is where our attitudes have got to be in check. Here is where we have to not be uh, judgmental, but yet know. See, we're, we're still, we are people that know trees by the fruit, it, by fruit they bear too, right? We look, we're to look at uh, a tree and say, well, that's an apple tree, that's a... That's an orange tree. That's that's a pear tree. You know that's that's those that that's the thing that we we're to look at people's lives not in a judgmental attitude, but to be able to say, you know what? I think they need Jesus. There's a certain amount of judging that we must do to be able to know how to approach. And we also the most important part is to be filled with the Holy Spirit. You see, if we're filled with the Holy Spirit then the Holy Spirit's going to speak through us at, at times that we, we don't, know, don't even know what He's doing, really. And, and, and when, he's, when we're a living testimony of, of God's grace, 
I'm telling you, there'll be days you walk with God and you get to the end of the day and you'll go, you know what? I just witnessed to two or three people. I didn't even plan that. I didn't even try. He laid them in my lap. <laughs> Not literally, but you know. He dropped them right in my, at my doorstep. And all I had to do is just tell them the truth. All I had to do is share with them some passage. All I had to do was just give them what he gave me. Hey, this is another reason it's so important to have daily quiet time, daily walk with God, daily start your day before anything else hits your schedule. Make sure you have time with God because when you do that, you will be shocked how many times what he gave you that morning he has you to give to somebody else that evening or the following day. You see what, he, what he's doing? He's preparing us. Being a living testimony of him. That's, he, wants us, he wants us to be an instrument in his hands. Just deal with uh, repentance. He's asking a question. If you look down to verse, I think it's the last part of verse 6. He says, should I come before him with burnt offerings, with your old calves? Would the, would the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with 10,000 streams of oil? Should I give my firstborn for my transgression, the child of my body, for my own sin? What, what's The questions here is, is showing us that God is not looking for a religious act. He's not looking for something for you to just give something back. He's not. You, this may be a shock to you, but he doesn't need your money. And some of our some of our folks may say, "Brother Kirk, be careful," because the church does. <laughs> we need money to operate. Obviously, uh, the Gideons need money to 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 give Scripture. But that's just a tool. You think God's limited to? My offering or yours? No. He didn't He didn't need my money. He didn't have to have my resources. I don't have anything really that... Well, I don't have anything he hadn't given me. But I'll tell you, what he, what he really... What God... One of the things that God despises, I believe... Or let's, maybe I should phrase it this way. One of the things I think... Would, grieves his heart. It's people that come into his presence willing to give a gift and the heart not be right. And it reminded me, what he's saying here reminded me of Psalm 51. And if you want to turn there, turn to Psalm 51. This is a beautiful picture of repentance. A beautiful picture. If you ever wonder what true repentance looks like, go to Psalm 51. And if you uh, if you're a note taker, jot this down. If you're if you mark in your Bibles, I would strongly encourage you to to jot somewhere in the uh, uh, the, the side of your passage if you have room or uh, in your notepads or whatever. But to put David's repentance. David had committed, he had committed murder. He had, he had King David. He had uh, committed adultery with Bathsheba. And most believe it had been about a year's time before the prophet Nathan pointed to, to him and said, you are the man. You're the one. And he repented. And what did he say? Well, just think. Look with me a little bit at, at this passage. Uh, listen to his heart. And you tell me if, if you think this is true repentance from King David. Be gracious to me, God, according to your faithful love. According to your abundant compassion, blot out my rebellion. Wash away my guilt and cleanse me from my sin. For I am conscious of my rebellion and my sin is always before me. My sin is always before me. Against you, you alone. 
One of the greatest things about re- one of the greatest steps, or there, there can let me put it this way: the, the only way to have true repentance, first of all, is to take ownership. We can't come to God's presence and, and say, "Lord, I repent of this. I did what you say I did. I, I've sinned against you." But I wouldn't have done that if if He wouldn't have made me mad. I, I wouldn't have reacted that way if if my if my wife wouldn't have said that. I wouldn't have reacted that way if my neighbor wouldn't have acted and did what he did. You just messed up the whole thing. You, you're not repenting. you got to take ownership. It's nobody's fault but yours. You don't answer for anyone else's sin, but you got to answer for all of yours. So David took ownership against you. You alone I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. Now, he's not saying he's the only one he sinned against. He's saying right here is where I've got to start. This is, this is what, th- th- ultimately it's God who I've offended. But he, David's sin was far-reaching. It affected his whole family. And by the way, <clears throat> he later on had a son that was trying to kill him. He had all kinds of turmoil in his family. And I believe that's what he's talking about when he says... My sin is ever before me. See, you can get forgiveness, but the consequences of sin is long-lasting. You alone, I have sinned and done this evil in your sight. So you are right when you pass sentence. You are blameless when you judge. Indeed, I was guilty when I was born. I was sinful when my mother conceived me. Surely, your desire... And you desire integrity. You desire integrity in the inner self, and you teach me wisdom deep within. Purify me with with hyssop, and I will be clean. Wash me, and I will be whiter than snow. L- let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones you have crushed rejoice. Turn your face away from my sins and blot out all my guilt. God, create a clean heart for me. And renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not banish me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore the joy. I love this. Restore the joy of your salvation. Not my salvation. Your salvation. It's a gift of God. Restore the joy of your salvation to me. And give me a willing spirit. Then I will teach the rebellious your ways, and sinners will return to you. You see, do you think David has realized how he's impacted his kingdom? Do you think he may have realized all of the people in the palace that he had authority over? Can you imagine the whispering that was going on? Can you imagine the servants that saw firsthand from the day that he sent Bathsheba, sent for her and brought her to the palace? Can you imagine the kind of stuff? They knew. There was somebody that knew, a lot of people that knew. Can you imagine when David realizes at least a portion of the effects of all of the people that has been affected by his sin? Now he's just praying, God, just let me walk with you again. I can't fix it. This is the king who is on his knees. I can just picture him being on his face before God saying, I can't fix it. And I'm sorry. I've done, I have hurt so many people. But he took ownership. But listen to this. Save me, verse 14. Save me from the guilt of bloodshed. God, the God of my salvation, my tongue will sing of your righteousness. Lord, open my lips and my mouth will declare your praise. Now, here's where I really want to get to. What we just read in the book of Micah. See if this does not sound very similar. You do not want, he's talking to God, 
You do not want a sacrifice or I would give it. You are not pleased with a burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. God, you will not despise a broken and a humble heart. Your your word, your text may say contrite. In your good pleasure, cause Zion to prosper. Build the walls of Jerusalem. Then you will delight in righteous sacrifices, whole burnt offerings. Then bulls will be offered on your altar. Remember, this is Old Testament, okay? We don't have to sacrifice animals anymore. David wasn't saying in the Old Testament times not to sacrifice. He was saying, my sacrifice is worthless if my heart is not right. And he's saying, Lord, I know if all I had to do was just give a sacrifice, I'd do it. If that's all I had to do to be right with you, I would do it. But you're not pleased with that. The only thing that's going to make things right is for me to humble myself before you and have a contrite heart. And to be broken before you. Basically is what he's saying. If I'm, And you have broken me. God knows how to do that by the way, doesn't he? Doesn't he? He, he knows how to. He knows what bu- fu- uh, buttons need to be pushed or pressed. He knows what is so close and near and dear to us. He knows what we elevate in, uh, as a, in importance in our lives. He knows those relationships, both good and bad in our lives. He knows all of that. He knows how to remove one when needed. He knows. He knows. He knows. He has told you back in Micah in verse 8 of 6, chapter 6. He, he has told you what is good and what it is the Lord requires of you. What does He require of us? Well, I'm glad you asked. Act justly. Love faithfulness. And walk humbly with your God. Yours may say, love mercy. The voice of Yahweh calls out to the city, and it is wise to fear your name. Pay attention to the rod and the one who ordained it. Now, as we talk about this this word or this expression of repentance, this act of repentance, I think it would be good for us to, as well, to flip over... (laughs) to Luke, the New Testament, Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18 and verse 9. This is a parable that uh, the Lord Jesus taught. He, uh, he presented, and remember the parables are teachable stories to apply spiritual truth. So Jesus, he was even asked by the disciples, he was asked by by probably many uh, different people at different times, why do you teach in parables? And it's amazing at that specific, or one specific time, he said, well, teach so you'll understand, but the people that don't understand, some of these things are hidden from them. And he, he, I believe he was really trying to get the disciples many times to understand, you know, if you'll pay attention, if you'll listen, I'll expose things to you that they don't have a clue about. Religious leaders, the Pharisees who thought they knew everything, right? Certain things were hidden from them. They could not only understand, they couldn't even comprehend many of the things Jesus taught. They were stuck. But here is a parable, and you're probably very, some of you very familiar with it. But this is, I think, a a picture that Jesus was uh, presenting uh, to help 
help them understand what does true repentance look like? What does what does the the process of repenting look like? What and here you could even say it's it's really about prayer. Well, yeah. Um, you could say a whole lot of it's about having the wrong attitude in prayer. But today I want to apply it as a picture of repentance. Verse 9, He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and looked down on everyone else. I'm glad we don't have any problem with that today, aren't you? <laughs> All people everywhere like that, isn't it? Um, two men went up to the temple to pray. One a Pharisee, the other a tax collector. And uh, by the way, we've compared the tax collectors to modern day IRS agents. And as much as we (laughs) don't like IRS uh, people, it's not even a comparison between them and the tax collectors. Tax collectors, they not only collected what they were asked to collect, they, they give them the freedom to collect more than they, than they, uh, were required in order to get whatever they wanted, in many cases, for themselves. So they could gain personally by collecting above and beyond what they were told to collect, and they could keep it for themselves. Did y'all know that? Did y'all know that about tax collectors? I'm just telling you that so you'll know why they were hated so much. They literally could take from whoever they wanted. So... This tax collector and a Pharisee. Y'all got the pictures? These, these are not starting off in this story of two of my favorite people. The Pharisee was definitely, he was, this Pharisee, you know, he, he's, can you picture him? He's got to be religious and proper and, and, uh, he, he's the one that always looking down his nose. I, I've got a, I've got a, uh, just a, I don't know. We all get our own images, you know, uh, visuals, but I think, of this, these Pharisees of the type, I don't know how tall they were, but if they weren't tall enough, I believe they'd stand up on a box so they could look down at you. Uh, I believe they always had glasses like this. Did they have glasses back then anyway? I don't know. Anyway, if they had glasses, I bet they wore them like this. So they could tilt their head back so they could look down at you. A lot of posturing. So you got a picture of the Pharisee, I guess, and this tax collector who takes everybody's money, right? These two went up to pray. The Pharisee was standing and praying like this about himself. (laughs) you got to love this. This is what the Pharisee said. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Boy, that's starting off good, isn't it? Greedy, unrighteous, adulterer. We always pick on the adulterers, don't we? It makes us feel better if we're not an adulterer, I guess. You know. Uh, by the way, you ever you ever think about talking to somebody about their sinfulness? Everybody's got to find somebody else that is worse than them. You ever notice that? We want to compare ourselves, make ourselves feel better. Usually, it's the murderer. Well, I've not, I've not killed anybody. I'm not a murderer. You're still a sinner. All right, so here he is. He's comparing himself with an adulterer. Or even like this tax collector. I bet he pointed at him when he said it. Lord, thank you that I'm not like everybody else. Thank you that that I'm not greedy. Thank you. Thank you that I'm not like an adulterer. Thank you that I'm not like that uh, that tax collector over there. Can you see the arrogance Or even like this tax collector. And then he goes on to brag about, in his prayer, brag about what he's doing or has done. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of everything I get. Okay, so you give and you fast. You just told us that your giving is worthless. You just told us that your fasting is worthless. I don't care what your religion is. I don't care what what you give. I don't care 
what your actions are, what what you're serving. You can be taking care of a thousand people that are homeless and giving them a place to live and giving them food to eat and doing all these great acts of kindness. If your heart's not right, you got some bad things coming. Do you understand? It's not what you do. It's really why are you doing it? Why do we do what we do? Why do we come to church? Why do we give to the local church? Why do we testify of His grace? You better have experienced it. Because I can tell you, you can do a lot of self-righteous acts. You can do so many good things in the community and still go to hell. That's the truth. And by the way, you won't hear that from Joel Osteen. All right. So, here we go. Verse 13. But the tax collector standing far off will not even raise his eyes to heaven, but kept striking his chest and saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I believe the old tax collector was getting through with his prayer. What do y'all think? I believe that old tax collector had realized, Lord, forgive me. I am a sinner. I have done it. I have committed sin against you and against others. It's me. And it says he wouldn't even look up because he's got his posture of humility. Not even raise his eyes. He is admitting his guilt. He is humbly praying. So Jesus follows up, I tell you, this one went down to his house justified rather than the other because everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. But the one who humbles himself will be exalted. You want to know the best place to start in in getting your journey on track, going to heaven, and assuming you're already a born-again believer, just humble yourself. Keep humbling yourself before the God. Keep starting out, start off your day humbly getting into the Word of God and be teachable. You know, the, the most difficult people to deal with in the church today, people that are not teachable. How do we get, how are we teachable? Well, first of all, realize we don't know everything. I'll tell you, the more you get in this book, the more you study, the more you realize you don't know. The more you teach a Sunday school class, the more you preach. If you're being brutally honest, it's just, it, I'm telling you, it's humbling just to go through the process. Because God has a way of teaching us and helping us to live out the Word, too. Man, there's so many. I've got a lot of stories for you on that. We don't have time for for them today, but there's so many stories. I have many of y'all do too. Just this journey that we're on, and how God allows certain things to happen to us. We don't we don't like it at the time because it hurts, but it just could be. I don't know about you. I'm speaking for myself. There's certain things He allows in my life. I I I hate it at the time. I don't like it, but it's a process that he puts me through that causes me to admit how sinful I am. It causes me to look at him, how perfect and righteous he is and what he has done for me and and, and, and having a heart of gratefulness to say, Lord, everything you say is true. Everything you say in your word, the the word of God, what it says I am, I am. And I may want to compare myself with a murderer. I may want to compare myself with an adulterer because it makes me feel better about myself. But the truth is, I'm a wicked sinner. And I need a Savior just like everybody else. We can look at the... The drug addict today, we can look at the person that's in the, laying in a, literally laying in a ditch on the side of the road. 
And apart from the grace of God, we are no better. Apart from the grace of God, we're, we're headed to the same place that they're headed. People need Jesus today. Truth is, everybody needs Jesus. And the way to get to Jesus is through repentance. Repentance is not a word that we like to hear, not something we like to do, but it's something that's not only necessary, it, it's the way of the cross. It's the way to the cross. It's the way to experience a personal a personal salvation. If you would stand where you are. If you've never experienced this personal relationship I'm talking